uh, afternoon session is on transgenerational trauma, which, uh, given the fact that it's uh, now 70 years since the end of the Greek Civil War, is of particular interest, uh, not only because it, it's a historical thing, but uh, the, the trauma suffered by people in the Balkans uh, in the first half of the 20th century uh, seem to uh, be passed down from generation and even multiple generations. Uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Viliana Filippo here with us today. Uh, she is a Macedonian from uh, Belis in Skopje, uh, who actually uh, emigrated to the United States uh, a number of years ago. And she has a BA in Slavic literature and languages. And about 10 years ago, she became interested in uh, mental health and uh, became a clinical psychologist with, uh, uh, with training in psychoanalysis. She's also a clinical supervisor of trainees in Los Angeles. Uh, she's had uh, She's, a, she's done research on social and multicultural issues uh, from a depth perspective. Uh, before she was involved in mental health, mental health field, uh, she was uh, a journalist and writer on Macedonian TV, and she was even involved in, in editing uh, for a publisher in Macedonia. And she is uh, the founder of the American School in of Macedonia and Spokane as well. So, um, so, as I say, we're delighted that she uh, has come all the way from Los Angeles to join us here in Toronto this afternoon. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, I do want to take this opportunity to thank you, Ben, for uh, bringing me here so I can speak about what was really in my heart to a larger community. I don't have many chances to do this in Los Angeles very small community with my students. So I'm glad to talk to you today. Is it true? The idea to present this, this knowledge that I have to all of you was to have sort of interactive uh, kind of presentation. But then I then inspired me with his questions and then I started to research more and it became sort of like a large uh, long long paper. So I decided to actually read it because I have quite interesting information I want to deliver to you. So bear with me, the, the paper will be about 40 minutes, I hope, um, and um, then we can have a discussion and we can feel free to ask questions and I would love to hear stories. So it's transgenerational trauma and resilience, the topic, the unthought known or nameless rupture and repair. The study of transgenerational transmission of trauma began with a look at the Holocaust trauma. It has been in the past 20 years that scholarship of, on witnessing testimony and transgenerational transmission have extended beyond the Holocaust to other political and social traumas and genocides. A lot of research has been done on African American slavery, Native Ameri American vanishing in the U.S., Armenian and Cambodian genocides, and needless to say, the Balkan Wars in the 90s. Common large group traumas include wars, genocides, political persecution, and exile. Why the notion exists in the human psyche that in order for one to feel better, there must be denigration of another. Violence against women and children is really violence against all. All forms of oppression, whether it's racism, genocide, or exclusively exclusivity of a dominant group within a country or region, is a system that impacts everyone within it, pervasively, deeply, and for the dominant group, often unconsciously. The dominance of power of one group over another must be approached by education, dialogue, partnership between men and women. Escape from violence requires a radical turn to the other. 
or consideration of the law. Let's look at uh, the basic terms of what is trauma. This is uh, presenting depth or psychoanalytic perspectives of the theory of trauma. For Freud, trauma in general is an experience of helplessness in the face of being overwhelmed. According to Freud, an individual is protected by a shield between the internal stimulus from the external stimulus when that shield is broken or penetrated as a result of some shocking or unbearably painful event, the sense of overwhelm happens. Thus flooding of unprocessed emotions occurs that causes the state of trauma. Masud Khan, a British psychoanalyst, introduced the, the distinction between shock trauma versus cumulative trauma. Shock trauma is immediate, sudden trauma, a brush with death, if you will. Um, for example, the survivor of a car crash, or a rape, or the loss of a close person, that's shock trauma. On the other hand, process trauma, or cumulative trauma, is continuous trauma of pain and suffering, for example, growing up with an alcoholic parent, living through a war, genocide, exile, etc. In the category of cumulative trauma belongs the topic that we discuss today, historical trauma. What is historical trauma? It has to do with collective cumulative emotional wounding over and across generations that results from massive cataclysmic events. These are events that don't just target individual, but target the whole collective community. The process that happens as a result causes personal trauma, but also it can be transmitted to larger, to later generations. Even the family members who did not have direct traumatic experience can feel the effects of that event generations later. What kinds of trauma there are um, now I'm going to discuss. <laughs> We're going to talk about basic concepts or trauma in order to make uh, understand how the transmission happens. Trauma refers to an important interaction which has gone seriously wrong. When, when the caregiver, uh, in, in larger group trauma, usually social system or country, fails to provide an attunement for painful feelings to a child or adult. Now, there, there are a few kinds of trauma. Personal trauma, car accident, domestic violence, war experience, war trauma, uh, usually PTSD um, is the result of that personal trauma. Um, intergenerational trauma, that's the other kind. That's Intergenerational trauma is conscious and the transmission utilizes such processes as fantasy formation and identification. It is organized into a family narrative that successfully passed from one generation to the other. The stories told contain the information transmitted consciously to the next generation. Now, the third kind, which we're most interested in here, is the transgenerational transmission, and that, that differs from the intergenerational transmission. Transgenerational transmission refers to unconscious mental content passed on that which is dissociated, primitive, and unintegrated. This kind of transmission is not symbolized in words or through stories. These are fragments of mental representations, pieces of told or untold story. They are usually expressed by acting out unprocessed emotions, such as hate, envy, engraved cultural beliefs, gestures, unnamed sadness, dread and anxiety, recurring dreams and nightmares, etc. These are some of the manifestations. Now, the transgenerational trauma is most likely to be transmitted when, uh, when large group trauma occurs. Here I want to explain the concept of a shared chosen trauma <coughs> of a large group. That uh, <coughs> discussed extensively. When a large group like the Macedonian group shares losses, feels helpless and victimized by another group, and share humiliating injury, is key to identify the process of transgenerational transmission. 
Someone may ask, why is then chosen trauma when the group does not choose to be victimized? It is chosen, in fact, because just like an individual, a large group can be said to make unconscious choices. Therefore, the term chosen reflects the unconscious choice. Although large groups may have sustained a number of traumas throughout their history, only some of them remain alive over a period of century. Thousands and millions of people in the large group shared the mental representations of certain traumas. The chosen trauma then represents the incapacity of the traumatized past generations to mourn their losses, as well as failing to reserve the humiliation and injury to the group's self-esteem inflicted by another large group, usually geographical neighbor. What, uh, this means that any kind of trauma can not be healed without a mourning process. Now, this is key, uh, key term when we talk about trauma. Mourning process is uh, something that has to happen in order for the person to be restored. The mourning process, or lack of it, in immigrants, refugees, and other survivors of historical trauma is the major cause for the transmission of the DGT. The situation becomes even more complex and tragic in cases of forced immigration. When people move from one location to another to a foreign location, they experience multiple profound losses. <coughs> loss of family and friends, loss of home and country, loss of ancestors' burial grounds, loss of familiar language, foods, smells, songs, loss of previous identity and its support system. All these location experiences can be examined in terms of the immigrants or refugees' ability to mourn and or resist the mourning process. Freud wrote his famous paper, Mourning and Melancholia, in 1917. He was the first one who really talked about what mourning is. Um, mourning is the process of experiencing the pain and all other negative feelings about the loss. But if this has not been done, the melancholic state sets in and lasts for a long time. In many severely traumatized individuals, unresolved mourning may lead to a deficit in the ability to symbolize. This unmetabolized, un unsymbolized mental structures are then transmitted to future generations. These fragments can be thought as part of unconscious transgenerational transmission of hate, war, and violence. So the inability to mourn and be vulnerable to pain can cause the violence and trauma to continue to be passed on. The mourning process is very complex and should be a topic of another lecture. Some of the distinctions I will mention here are as follows. Grieving is transitory matter. It's the expression of the pain. But mourning is an entire process and it takes time to resolve. Healthy mourning is expression of grieving and nostalgia, which is processing and letting go without hate as a feeling present. The people who are unable to mourn or unhealthy mourning can be stuck in melancholia, which may involve the feeling of hate. And the second part is perennial mourning, which is another kind of fixation, which involves holding on to a specific object that reminds the person of the loss, or hearing the voices of the past related to the loss. Like um, I had a patient uh, example of perennial mourning, and a patient who lost a brother, and he would drive a car, and he would listen, he would talk to the brother, and he's telling me in, in, in session this, he would talk to the brother, and I thought that the brother is alive. He would have conversations to the brother. And, and then when we explored more, and he, 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 then, he then said, well, my brother is dead. But, but it gives me feeling not nervous when I talk to him. So perennial mourning is a kind of mourning where they don't want to let go of the object because it makes them anxious to feel the feeling of loss. So how the transmission of transgenerational trauma really happens? 
I propose that the mode of transmission is much more understandable if we utilize the lens of attachment theories and research. How a person carries within his or her mind and body numerous histories of experiences within the family's legacy of traumas and losses, along with the family's culture and external world. How do trauma survivors transmit these unspoken fragments to their children? This exploration, I believe, is imperative for psychoanalysis. Parents and children from form an attachment unit that allows for deep unconscious communication of fear and safety, of anxiety and security, of closeness and distance, love and hatred, and so much more. All of this is often transmitted through the registers of attunement and misattunement, and the active process of self-other regulation of affects. The French psychoanalyst Andre Green was first to describe a version of this experience for a child he termed this kind of absent parent the dead mother, someone alive but not really present, once alive but now due to depression, a blank or white state, absent anxiety or mourning, which he called psychosis blanche. The child detaches from this dead mother while simultaneously identifying with her. In the unconscious psyche, the deadness and the loss of meaning are now installed. Children are constantly observing their parents' gestures and affects, absorbing their parents' conscious and unconscious minds. In the shifting registers of attunement and misattunement, children adjust and adapt to the emotional presence and absence of their caregivers, the parents, always searching for attachment. These searches begin at birth and occur before there are words, when there are gazes, stares, sounds, and touch, as well as the, as the absence of these. This is how stories are told, even when not spoken, in the nonverbal and preverbal affective realms, silent and vocal, yet played out in subtexts, often on the implicit level. This is to happen for a human being in the nucleus of the primal audible family, which is two parents and a child which is one generational model and extends to a broader view that incorporates the influences of disrupted attachment across multiple generations. Fundamentally, attachment is the oxygen of our emotional lives, serving to create a feeling of safety and security, allowing us to be socially human and teaching us how to self-regulate our affective lives. When trauma revisits us transgenerationally, it is within the child empathic attunement and bond that the mode of transmission can be found. When there is unmetabolized trauma on the part of the parent, the child, in order to attach to the parent, will need to enter and become enmeshed with its trauma scene. Both through empathic mirroring and dissociative attunement, the parent's trauma enters the child's cellular makeup before there are words, and thus before a narrative can be told. There is haunting quality of the transgenerational transmissions. Ghosts of trauma always linger where mourning has occurred. Every one of us in this room has ghosts. To conclude, um, in the absence of fully emotionally vital and present parent, the child attaches not only to what is present, but also to what is absent what is alive as well as what is dead. In it. Empty circle, psychic holes, dead third, dying with dying. These are all similar concepts that researchers have coined to describe the process of dissociation, fragmentation, and identification of the caregiver. The psychoanalyst Van Kolk has spent his entire career researching and writing about large group conflicts the psychology of immigrants and refugees, and the transmission of transgenerational trauma. He proposed that the transgenerational trauma is passed on the child in two ways, by identification and depositing. Now, these two concepts are fascinating, and I'm sure you will, you will find them very familiar. The identification process in early childhood happens when the child absorbs and internalizes the image of the parent. 
which I earlier explained with the attachment theory. However, there are other environmental influences the children integrate from their respective environments, which inform developing images of self and others, which are called mental representations. The children identify with a range of aspects of significant individuals, from realistic ones to fantasize, for example, heroes, wished for, or even evil ones. They assimilate mothering, fathering, sibling, and other mentoring functions. The identification process is also influenced by a larger group to which the child's family belongs, like the church or a society. These large groups communicate to the child religious, racial, and nationalistic messages, or messages of victimization and powerlessness. Early on, the child learns to identify with a group through certain foods, dances, music, nursery rhymes, myths, folk stories, heroes, important events, and art as well. Some of the hero figures that contribute to the sense of Macedonian identity are Krali Marko, which you all know, Alexander the Great, and Bolan Deutsche. In the same way, historical trauma can have a way of shaping the child's identity through the mental representations of the shared perceptions of the historical injury. The second process is depositing. Depositing is another way of passing the transgenerational trauma. While identification explains how the child assimilates, assimilates aspects from his parents and environment into their self-image, depositing describes how the caregivers put their own historical traumatic experiences into the child. With identification, the child takes active role in selecting and integrating mental representations, but with depositing, the child is a passive recipient of another person's history. Deposited representations, in fact, illuminate how the transgenerational trauma is transmitted. A common example of depositing of mental representations is the phenomenon of a re replacement child. To illustrate what this means, I'll give an example. When parents lose a child to death, the mental image in their minds never dies. It persists to exist, and when a new child is born, this image is now given to the newborn and unconsciously becomes part of, of her or her or his self-image. The parent often relates to the second child as if it is the first one. Sometimes the new infant is given the name of the dead child, as well as the crib and the toys that he plays with. The newborn child has no experience of the dead one, it is, in fact, the parent who deposits the image of the dead child into the new child and tasks the newborn to keep the dead child alive. Creating this dynamic of the replacement child is not unusual among the survivors of shared history trauma, such as war and persecu persecution. In such cases, the image, uh, uh, the, image <coughs> the survivor carries and deposits is not of a dead child, but of a cumulative hurt endured of a catastrophe or shared trauma. The survivor who had internalized self and object images linked with injurious events now unconsciously passes on or deposits or transmits these images onto their offsprings. These painful images are representations of wounded self, the victim within, and victimizing the other the hate held toward the perpetrator, and all other painful emotions that come along with these mental representations. What renders these situations traumatic and tragic and helps continue to pass the trauma on is the inability to mourn the original tragic events and the losses or the unthought knowns. Uh, Bolas um, is the psychoanalyst who came up with this term. Uh, the internal knowing is lodged into the unconscious. Sometimes it is manifested, manifested as keeping secrets, in the case of melancholia. Sometimes it's holding on to object or voices from the past for a new morning. And sometimes comes out in recurring dreams. Question. Is keeping secrets a manifestation of transgenerational trauma? Yes. Keeping secrets create the unthought knowns 
in the subsequent generations. Secrets can silent, silently traumatize and cause the subsequent generation to feel the traumatic effect in different ways. There is no such thing as silence, meaning silence pertaining to keeping secrets. The passing on a cigarette from one generation to another can be delicate or obvious. And all of this can be silently transmitted. Once passed, they can even form life of themselves uh, on its own, where they comprise a core of one's identity. Fonagy is a contemporary psychoanalyst interested in, in, in that there is a, a, an implicit knowing of the secrets to, of close others, which has to do with the process of mentalization. That's a, that's a second language concept. I'll try to explain it as simple as possible. Um, mentalization is the individual's capacity to read another person's mind in terms of intentions and emotions, and in turn, the capacity to understand how one is read by another person or an audience, which our current president has none of it. Um, so it's the capacity to understand others and to understand how others perceive them. Most mentalization occur in a non-conscious or implicit fashion. For example, when a parent is unable to incorporate and think about a piece of reality, and cannot then enable the child to do so safely through playing with the frightening ideas, this reality forming calls psychic equivalence. Neither child nor parent can metabolize the thought, and the unthinkable thoughts are passed on from generations from one to the next. Another question, how many generations can be affected from the transgenerational trauma? Three or more generations can be caught up in the transmission. I was told up to seven. Feinberg coined the term telescoping of generations, which means the parental past and child's current reality blur together. They become fuzzy as a result of the parental usage of the child with the depositing phenomenon. It takes half a century to process a war, an even longer gestational period of silence. Let's turn to epigenetics now. Epigenetics is a growing field which looks at the bidirectional interchange between heredity and environment, or popularly called versus, uh, nurture versus nature effect. It offers explanation of how environmental factors and historical time may affect gene expression and possible inheritable aspects of these expressions. For example, recent research in neuroscience suggests that epigenetics may account for some of the uh, findings of transgenerational transmission of stress as measured from the research literature on rats. The link has been identified between disorganized attachment strategies and elevated cortisol levels of stressors. In addition, human attachment studies have documented the intergenerational, intergenerational transmission of attachment strategies over three generations. Kohler, summarized, uh, in, in his summarizing research findings on the effects on environmental, on epigenetics, writes, some epigenetic marks, for example, specific chemical attachments such as methyl group, can be transgenerationally transmitted. In the context where epigenetics changes can be inherited and passed on to subsequent generations, the nurture of one generation contributes to the nature of subsequent generation. In this way, we must conceptualize transgenerational transmission uh, in multiplied, determined, and non-linear ways. Transmissions are always multi-generational and richly influenced by context, both historical and personal, and are carried in the mind and the body. No one theory can solely explain this, and for that reason, we must draw from many resources and interview the various points of view to understand the complexity of experience. For example, in my previous research on Macedonian complex psyche, I explored the sociopolitical field, anthropology, 
history, and psychology. Very complex. Let's talk about resilience. It's my favorite. How can trauma be transmuted into positive experiences? What happens transgenerationally to diffuse or transmute what once was a horrific experience? The definition of resilience is the capacity to metabolize the traumatic effects, the ability to overcome serious hardships. The literature barely begins to include an explicit look on the strengths transmitted to subsequent generations and the enduring capacities for love, bonding, devotion, and activism that we often find in succeeding generations. To transmute violent repetitions into repair, these capacities need to be illuminated. <coughs> Attachment differs from trauma in that it is both broader and at the same time more explicit in its prediction of outcomes. Attachment happens in childhood only. Trauma happens in adulthood too. Attachment happens in, uh, uh, this explains the factor of resilience actually. Resilience is individually defined based on the nature of attachment. If the child is securely attached and had good enough parenting, good enough, not perfect, in the force of severe trauma, resilience will be present. There's also another component of role reversal that happens in relational trauma. The children of traumatized parents who are sometimes alive and sometimes dead and, and dissociated, these children have no other way but to learn to attune to the parental states and attempting to regulate their affect and what's broken on the inside. This may also be the place in which the child grows a kind of resilience. Since in role reversal, the child is called upon to grow up sooner and to be, in a precautious manner, the one who manages feeling better. In psychology, we use the term of parentified children for these children. And very often, when these children come in treatment, the, the major problem they have is pleasing. We deal we, we, we work with pleasing. How, how can you stop please other people? You need to think of yourself. So that, that can be one of the ways it comes out. Let's talk about the Macedonian psyche. How do we understand the Macedonian psyche and what makes this group unique? I have been interested in studying the cosmogonic rituals of birth and dying and concluded through my research that not only they contributed to the formation of cultural, national, and personal identity, but they're a symbolic form of expression of unconscious elements of both the transgenerational trauma and the resilience. As I mentioned before, I have collected some narratives of group trauma and suffering through my research with informants. That is the oral tradition that exists out there. But the large body of narratives in the Macedonian culture are passed through the generations in the folk literature. This is the example of chosen trauma amongst Macedonians. The stories about the defeated heroes are fascinating in the Macedonian folk literatures. In the Macedonian history, Kali Marko was a father figure for the people, but rather a weakened father who lost power to make his people feel protected and secure. He was trapped between his desire to help people and his feeling of helplessness, evoked by the real presence of the oppressor. This paradox is the theme of the tragic existence. Similarly, tragic existence has Bolen Deutsche, another defeated hero in the history. The national figure of Krali Marko represents the deepest psychological dynamic of the entire Macedonian group. His defeat against the giant horse was tragic, but his loyalty <coughs> and care represent the unbreakable group spirit of the people. These elements can be found in the Macedonian core identity. What is the Macedonian core identity or complex? What is core identity? When a mental representation of massive collective trauma becomes an ethnic or national hallmark, a stamp, it must become weaved as part of the core identity of every individual of the large group. This is what we call chosen trauma. 
Throughout the history, it is established that Macedonian people have struggled with finding recognition for their identity. In my previous research, I have worked on analyzing the complexity of the Macedonian psyche. I have found that the Macedonian psyche contains a set of conscious and unconscious elements that form a particular complex. This complex is of a bipolar nature, meaning it contains both positive and negative behavioral patterns previously transgenerationally integrated in the psyche. The fear of annihilation is the more, most fundamental fear and is a core element lodged in the Macedonian psyche. So let's talk a little bit about fear of annihilation and bipolarity of the complex. As a result of many centuries of oppression and transgenerational trauma, the Macedonian group psyche became fragmented. In the absence of a strong parental protective figure, Macedonians were exposed to essential positive masculine per, uh, paternal aspects, which is probably marked with the symbol of the name and the identity. Thus, weakened and defeated mental representations were integrated in their group psyche, which led to development of a cultural complex or core identity. The dark shadow forces, when I say dark, they are not necessarily dark, but they're shadow. It's a union complex of the unconscious, the shadow that I'm using the term for here. Some of them were the strength and power were projected onto the other, on the oppressor, which in our cases, the folk literature is the Tsarnarapino. Macedonians remain, remained conscious of all the positive maternal aspects split off from the negative, weakened, paternal ones. This explains the bipolar nature of the complex, and it gets triggered through the following process in the Macedonian psyche. The threat of recurring trauma and unsafe situations activates the defense, the self-protective, self-care system, which sends further messages that if this group openly and aggressively expresses the dissatisfaction, might lead to group annihilation. The agitated fear of the aggressor in the past, the Ottoman oppressors in the present time, Greece, arrests the authentic expression. It seeks safe way to exist and avoids to cause bad image or provoke anger, elicit shame, uh, and to trigger more oppression, exile, and annihilation. Thus, it remains small and inferior. It destabilizes the self-esteem of the Macedonian group. How many of you do you recall hearing the phrase and when we talk to Macedonians? We will be divided. There's no existence for us. We will not exist in a few years. They will divide us. So that's the small talk. Part of the fear of annihilation is illustrated in the saying, Macedonia will be non-existing. It will be divided again one day which exacerbate perpetual transgenerational threatening feeling of loss of identity and further transmits through generations. Examples of transgenerational trauma in the Macedonian psyche. Here's the account of a woman who was telling me a favorite bedtime story passed through generations in her family, carrying unconscious elements that gradually are becoming conscious through the narrative. The old times when the Turks were ruling were very harsh times. The Romans were ruling first, 300 years, then the Turks, 500 years. We, the Macedonians, were abused and maltreated since Alexander the Macedonian. We are cursed because of him, because his mother wanted to poison him. The curse goes like this. Macedonia should not exist, and Macedonian name should not exist. The Macedonian people should be wretched and devastated. They should migrate to foreign lands and not to remain in their own. This is why we're cursed. This is why Macedonian people move out in the world. They do not want to stay here. She's telling me this story and not, not conscious about what she's passing as a message. I asked her at the time, do you know how people who immigrated feel? You don't, but you're still telling me this. She says, yeah, I don't know, but this is what, what we know. Um, so that's, that's the negative piece. I'm going to give you an example of resilience now. 
the sorrow sin verse. Here is the account of one of my participants talking about the grieving and the, when the burial uh, rituals. They, meaning the sorrow singers, lament both the dead and the living. Come on, Anne, do not lament me, I'm alive. When they begin, they keep going on and on. If you do not tell them to stop, she will make you feel like you're dead. They cry for about an hour. Twenty women gather and lament together for an hour. What a chaos. For example, if a young person dies, they go on sometimes for a couple of hours. When we come home, we're swollen in our faces, grief stroking and crying. What is the function of the sorrow singers? They're fostering the collective process of healthy mourning. The mourning then focuses not only on the dead person, but mourning of many other losses is being processed through the death of one person. And that facilitates the healing function. When the crying gates are open, the flood of memory of old losses is being grieved. If someone cannot tolerate that collective grief, or would avoid funerals altogether, that person is resisting mourning. That person may be stuck in the melancholic state and possibly carry the unconscious of transgenerational trauma. That person is afraid of grieving because the pain may be too big. It may never stop, is the fear. Aegean exodus and how to heal the wounds from the transgenerational trauma. During the Aegean exodus, personal history was destroyed. Subjectivity and peculiarity were erased, and human subjects became enumerated objects, nameless and unrecognizable. Their names were changed. They were forced to learn Greek language and forbidden to speak their own by brutal methods employed by government officials. The people who were forced out of their homes and now in exile through Europe, US, Canada, and Australia still live with those ghosts from the nursery, which are the ghosts from the past. In the most recent history with the Aegean Exodus, families were torn apart by separation, lost and alienated children were dispersed throughout the world. How do we ameliorate the helplessness, shame, humiliation, and victimization of these families that these families endure? Many of the survivors of this tragic process gather to tell their stories in service of healing. But many carry within unconscious fragments of that trauma passing it onto the future generations. It remains both an individual and collective task of the Macedonian society to become more conscious of these elements because it is, it is who we all are. This trauma is our core identity. These are numer there are numerous ways how to help the unconscious to be illuminated and mourned. Individually at home, pay attention to the elderly stories, very important. Listen to the narratives and mourn together. Be attuned to the unconscious messages the unspoken truths, the secrets untold, visuals, expressions, patterns that do not serve any longer. Catch yourself what you tell to your children, the messages you pass on to them. Are they going to be stuck in the past, or are they going to have a message of let's move forward, let's have a better life? Seek communal support music, dance, celebrating birth, weddings, and mourning at funerals, etc. These are the cosmogonic rituals so important for the Macedonians that foster resilience. And I would add here being inspired by you. The arts, connect with the arts. Engage through peaceful activism for social justice. I think that's what we're doing today. Seek professional, medical, and psychological help for more severe or chronic presentations and problems. And if you are an MD or a mental health professional, pay attention to the melancholic states in your community. Organize psychoeducation, for bono work, needless to say, and will do, or lining up proper referrals for psychotherapy. Visit your old country, painful sites, monuments, memorials, 
Talk to people that will help you learn the truths of what happened. Macedonians knew well intuitively throughout centuries how to deal with the trauma. They had their rituals, storytelling, dažički, grieving the losses collectively. And as conclusion, all forms of oppression, whether it's racism, genocide, or exclusivity of a dominant group, without a country or a region, is a system that impacts everyone within, within it, pervasively, deeply, and for the dominant group, often unconsciously, I said that. Duped by the leader, ideology, parent, creed, the consciously or unconsciously deceptive partner, one feels so humiliated to have believed and needed to believe. The victim now carries often suicidal shame that should belong to the perpetrators, a shame that impedes or at least complicates needed remembering and mourning. Beyond deception and shame, each of us needs needs to engage in question, needs to engage the question of how the haunting past can be usefully remembered. And this is how. By telling the story to someone who can truly listen, the testimonial is a really important account. Mourning, we talked about that. Build monuments and memorials. I think you by gathering here and and, and um, Keeping this organization alive is monumental task, if it is a monument of its own kind. Gather for music, dance, ritual, sofra, movie festivals, arts. Consider that true memorials are turning in dialogue towards the other. Invite Greeks, talk to them, don't hate them, try to understand. And that will be the end. <laughs>